So there were two alternative titles for this talk, and they both work because there are so many different things that trees can do when they fall in the forest. If a tree falls and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? But if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, can it start a fire? You may have heard about California's Dixie Fire in 2018. It was the second largest fire in Californian's history and it burnt almost a million acres and destroyed 1,300 buildings to say nothing of the lives that were lost. And it all started when a tree fell on a power line operated by Pacific Gas and Electric and it ignited. A complete tragedy and yet probably preventable. Electric utilities know this is a real problem. They spend $30 billion a year to manage vegetation. That is, making sure that trees do not come into contact with power lines. So vegetation management is the biggest line item in utilities operational budgets. And yet, the tree that struck the line in California was more than one of eight million trees within striking distance. And we're going to see this sort of thing more often. There are just more reasons why trees might fall over and why there might be more power lines near trees. And unfortunately, this tends to affect marginalized communities more than most. There's also more weather-related power outages coming soon as well. So a lot of factors combining to mean we really need to worry about what's going on with trees near our power lines. The five worst years for wildfires have happened in the last 14 in America. And as temperatures rise, those fires are burning hotter and wilder. And controlling fires that have already started is becoming an increasingly impossible task. Those power line fires are the big ones. And they're more likely to become catastrophic. Now, we can track fires from space. You can see here, not here, there, over to the sides. You can see to the sides, you can already see the fire quite well. You can see where they are, you can track their trend. They can be massive, these fires. They are easily seen from space, even 800 kilometers away. This is the campfire from California in 2018. But we need to tackle this problem before it starts, before ignition. We have to stop trees falling on power lines. And the company that I work for, Overstory, is a climate tech startup founded in Amsterdam and now with colleagues around Europe and the US. This is what we do. Overstory, in case you're wondering about the name and thinking about that very famous book, the Overstory is the top bit of the trees, the bit of the tree that you can see from space. And we describe ourselves as well as fighting the climate crisis because fires make the climate crisis worse. And we need to reduce power outages so we can build up more electric power as we decarbonize the grid. Now you might be thinking, why don't we put those power lines underground? But undergrounding a line costs 10 times more than an overground power line. So today I'm going to talk about some of the technology, the machine learning and satellite imagery that we use to do this. But it's not all about bits and data and compute. It's boots on the ground. It's very physical, tangible work with actual trees and actual power lines, which are wherever they are. They're not always in nice sunny places like this utility forester is having a great day in the sun. Sometimes they're in remote, hard to reach areas. Sometimes you're trying to reach those areas after a devastating storm. And sometimes the situations on the ground can be really hazardous as well. In America, power lines go over all kinds of different land, from national parks to private land, where people are not always keen to have state visitors coming and visiting. So it can be really directly hazardous to be a forester for a utility. And those utilities have to do more with less at the moment, so we have to change up how we work. The way that utilities manage their vegetation today is often by an inspection. An arborist will go and look at the trees along a line, maybe every five years or ten years, and write a report saying, these trees, they probably need trimming. And hopefully, there's enough money after paying for that arborist to go out to pay someone to go trim those trees as well. 
It's really inefficient and it's quite ineffective because a lot can happen to trees in five or ten years. They grow, for instance, which is a real challenge. And so we can see the need for better data to drive better vegetation management. And data also really helps with the scale of the challenge here. There just aren't enough boots on the ground to get around all the different places where trees are near power lines. And just as a reminder, those individual trees and cables between poles start small, but they add up big. So although you might think, oh, we could fly a drone and take a look at some of those trees, that doesn't work at the scale of the continental US. And thank you to Open Infrastructure Map for showing us here some of the power lines over there in America. So satellites can really help us scale the kind of work we do. And they help us scale the knowledge, the deep knowledge about trees and situations on the ground to the kind of scale we need for power line infrastructure. Foot patrols don't scale. LIDAR also gets really expensive. And LIDAR is the kind of thing you can do flying a plane over and taking a different kind of scan or maybe with a drone. So satellite kind of hits that sweet spot. And we have more satellites than ever before as well, which is really handy. So that's what Overstory uses. And we use this particular kind of satellite imagery. We task it. We say exactly where we want the satellite to go and when we want it to go to take pictures of trees. So you might know about some of the public domain satellite imagery that's out there today. And that's great, but it tends to be quite low resolution. The pixel size of the photographs is quite big. And it can be older or not so timely. And as we said, trees grow, they change, so we need a timely picture. So with Overstory, we tend to satellite task for our customers every year, so you get an annual update on exactly where your trees are. And we have to take those picture, pictures when the leaves are on the trees. You can't just go to take a picture in the middle of winter because it is really hard to identify the species or whether a tree is sick if it doesn't have leaves on it. So the satellite images we get have both a resolution, the pixel size, and they also vary in terms of things like the signal to noise ratio. And we use both optical and near infrared to understand the trees. And here's an example of some of the kinds of images that we see, just to give you a feel for what kind of resolution looks like. Um, aerial sometimes is higher resolution, but often they fly whenever they fly, and a lot of the areas we'd love to have images for, they've only taken pictures in the winter, so that's no good. 30 centimeters, though, like Pleiades Neo, which is an Airbus constellation, is pretty good. With 30 centimeters, we can identify trees that are declining, maybe starting to get sick, and we can also identify the species of those trees too. So it sounds kind of great, right? We have this amazing capability to take photos of the land from space and understand all about those trees. And we buy our images from companies like Airbus who do genuine rocket science, getting satellites up there, and this is one of the Pleiades Neo satellites that we use. Amazing technology. And then the last mile, that last little bit where they get the photographs they've taken for us to us, not always so great. It is amazing how they can do rocket science over here, but sometimes they send us the wrong images, or a different file format, or a totally different naming standard, all kinds of things. It can be different every time. So, yeah, it's not always rocket science. But eventually, we do get some images, some lovely big photographs. And then we have to prepare them so that we can actually use them to do the analysis. It's not quite as straightforward as point and click on a camera. So first of all, we do co-registration. And we do this because the, we get this photograph, and we have to figure out where on the ground is this photograph of. Now, they do give us some data for that, but it's kind of not very accurate. We're looking down at the exact location and shape and size of the tree. And it can make a difference whether a tree is, say, three feet or six feet from the power line. So we really need more accuracy than you usually get. And so we have to align the image exactly with some sort of reference on the ground. And you can see here a little bit what it's like trying to combine an image with a reference. So co-registration starts from registration, which is transforming data sets so they conform to some coordinate system. 
And then co-registration is transforming a data set to conform to a reference data set so you know exactly where it is. And we want to be able to do that because we're going to compare the location of the trees and the satellite image to the location of those power lines, which is a different data set. So co-registration starts with getting the two images and working out some matching points across the two of them. They're called ground control points, and that's how you know the point here on this photo, the point here on this photo, they're the same. And they need to be ground control points, literally at ground level, because if they're matching points up at the top of a building, say, then the imagery angle can move things around, so we focus on the ground. And when we've matched all those points up, you kind of do a warping to get the images to align, which is a little bit like straightening a duvet. You're kind of shifting and curving a little bit until it all sits neatly. So when you've co-registered your image, you also need to pan sharpen it. And this is combining images from different bands, such as the near-infrared and the optical, which may have different resolutions to create the nice crispy image that we want, that one at the bottom, high resolution with all the right bands in the right places. We're still not done. Next up, we do author rectification, and this is to account for the fact that the satellite is taking a picture from one particular point. But we really want our image to be nice and straight, kind of top down, wherever we're looking from. So to do that, we're adjusting for the camera angles and height variation to create that nice orthographic satellite view, rather than the perspective view that you get straight out of the satellite. So some fancy math there to get it all nice and tidy. And then finally, you've got a lovely satellite image ready to work with. So where are the trees? We have a segmentation model that identifies trees and bushes and bare ground and things that are not vegetation at all. So we see those trees. And Overstory does work at the individual tree level. So we are drawing an outline around each and every tree. Not by hand, by computer, but we still are looking at each tree, even though we work at scale. And then you can see here some false colors come in, and this shows some of the near-infrared band and helps us identify the difference between a healthy tree and a sick tree or a declining or a dead tree. But one of the other challenges we have is that the world is not flat, and so we also need to account for the ground height, which is a totally separate set of calculations. So, we've got the trees. What about the power lines? So utilities give us their data saying, here's where our pylons are, here's where the poles are, here's where the cables are in between. They're not always very accurate. Sometimes they're very accurate, but sometimes we need to do quite a lot of corrections to actually make sure we know where those poles are in an image, in a reference data set that we can compare with the satellite image. So we do some correction there to get it all nicely lined up. Some utilities, though, have really amazing data about their assets. They have LiDAR models, beautiful 3D scans that can show you exactly where the cable is, where the SAG is in it, where the pylons are, all that kind of thing. And sometimes they have that, we can use that data, but if they don't, then Overstory can do that. We can model the SAG on a cable because power lines are pretty heavy, and in the heat especially, they SAG in the middle, and also the sway in the wind. And so we also need to know the vertical attachment height where the cable is attached to the pole. There's some quite fancy things you have to do there. So the utility might say, oh, our poles, they're like 55 feet tall. And then sometimes we know that we have to do a bit of a calculation because that 55 feet, that's the length of the bit of wood. Some of that is buried underground and the cable isn't actually attached to the top either. So you've got to kind of juggle around to work out the height of the cable relative to the ground because we do all our work relative to the ground height and you've, that's where the land shape comes in, whether it's a hill or a valley or somewhere flat. So we've got the trees and the green, orange and red here is showing trees, bushes and declining trees. And then we add in the power lines um, and we're good to go. So now we can start to do some nice analysis to get our customers an understanding of which trees present the biggest hazard. So a quick reminder, this is how it works. We get the vegetation data from remote sensing, like satellites. 
We combine that data with what matters to the utility, such as their power line locations, and then we work with them to build a data-driven vegetation management program so they can make sure that the right trees get trimmed at the right time and we don't have trees hitting power lines. And all our utility customers use the data in slightly different ways. Um, so one of them is contractor audits because they often pay a contractor to go trim the trees rather than doing that themselves. And one of our first impact stories was actually about one of those contractor audits. So one utility had paid a contractor to go trim some trees in a really remote area. And that had been due to have happened several months ago. The contractor had said they'd done it, everyone was happy. But when our customer got their overstory report showing where the trees were in that remote area, they found the contractor just hadn't bothered to go trim those trees at all. So they were able to go take action because we were able to give them that data showing where the trees were and they could do something about it. So for utilities, they all think differently about the risk that trees present to their power lines. We focus a lot on encroachment risk and we use this matrix that you can see here to help our customers convert the way they think about risk into something that we can give them a nice risk score for. So some of them are worried about side encroachment, how near the trees are to the power line from the side. Some worry about overhang, are the trees starting to grow over the power line? And others are worried about trees underneath the power lines as well. So this matrix tries to capture that a little bit. Um, taking into account where the tree is, the height and the growth sideways, and where the power line cable is as well. And that means we can then give each individual span of a network, each piece of cable between two poles, a score saying how risky the trees near that line are. So you can see the tree height is really important here. It makes a big difference as to whether or not a power line is at risk. And to do that, we need to calculate what we call a canopy height, the height of the top of the tree. And knowing how tall the trees are relative to the ground is a tricky problem. We have the height of the power line relative to the ground, but the tree is a little bit trickier. So we need a digital surface model, as you can see at the top here. And we also need a terrain model to know where the ground is. That's the one at the bottom here. Then we subtract one from the other, and we get the height of the objects, or in our case, the trees. It is hard. Now, you've probably heard about recent things like Meta announced that they've done a global canopy map. Um, and you can buy digital surface models. Um, often they're a bit low resolution or a bit out of date. Everyone was excited about the Meta one because it's one meter resolution. Um, but we've looked at it, and it's quite variable in terms of the accuracy for trees in different places. And it's also drawn from many years of data aggregated together. I think it's more than a decade. And trees can change a lot in a decade. So for us, thinking about that very specific risk, exactly which trees present the biggest power line threat, we need more accuracy. So we use a stereo pipeline, uh, which take, uses two photos, stereo imagery. So as the satellite whizzes overhead, it takes one photo and then another one just a couple of seconds later. And then we can triangulate how high the tree is from that. And we use this nice open source processing um, stuff called S2P to do that. Step one, it's matching again. We've got these two photos, and again, we need to work out which tree, which piece of what photo is the same in both images. And there's a load of ways to do this. Um, SIFT, Lofter, we could talk about all the different algorithms using different machine learning techniques. But it's still not that easy. You think not a lot changes on the ground between a couple of seconds, but actually a lot does change. Cars drive along. Trees blow in the wind. Waves on the lake move along as well. So you've got to watch for that. You're trying to find points that really don't move so you can then do that great triangulation. So it is a little bit tricky. And we're always looking for new ways to do this and we're starting to explore some of the techniques in these papers, for instance, to give us some different ways to calculate that critical tree height. Working out if a tree is sick or dying is more classically machine learning based. And we can identify that with, as I said earlier, with a combination of near infrared and optical. And that can be really helpful for identifying areas of trees that might be suffering from a particular condition. 
and we work with arborists who can translate the kind of data that we can see from space into real actionable information for utilities. So an arborist can look at a cluster of dead trees and we have some great arborists on staff at Overstory and they'll say, hmm, that'll probably be emerald bark beetle. And if that set of trees is suffering from emerald bark beetle, this is what's going to happen to the trees in the surrounding area over the next couple of years. So that's really good to know. Another thing we analyze is directly the wildfire risk. And there are these data sets that show you things like the level of fuel, how much of the landmass is likely to burn. So you can get this kind of wildfire risk map. And we can combine that with data about the trees and the risks of trees falling on lines to get a really rich picture of what the wildfire risk could look like for our customers. That's one of the extra levels of analysis that we can do. Now, I talked earlier about that matrix and the encroachment of a tree growing sideways towards the power line or overhanging the power line. But another obvious risk is striking. That's where a tree falls onto the power line, perhaps from further away. Particularly if a tree might be up a slope, it can fall on a power line lower down. And so we also identify what we call strike trees. Strike trees can be any tree that could fall and hit a line, but we also look at um, declining trees because a sick tree is more likely to fall over than a healthy tree, so it's useful to have both those kinds of strike tree identified. And we can also identify species. And this is really useful for our customers who might have concerns about a particular species in their area. So for instance, one of our customers is very worried about willow because willow grows super fast. And so being able to tell them where all the willows are in the area that are near power lines is really helpful because they know they're going to keep an extra close eye on those willows to make sure they're not growing too near the power lines. And then we package all of that up into a beautiful web application that our customers can use, whether that's a forester out in the field looking at some trees and looking at some power lines, or whether it's folks back in the head office who are trying to plan a strategy for how they want to manage vegetation in the future. And yeah, it's great. As a startup, couldn't be happier that we have customers actually using this, working with vegetation and converting all of our data into actual plans to manage vegetation effectively to make sure that we don't have trees hitting power lines, causing those outages and causing wildfires. And we're going to need to keep doing this and scaling up because there's an awful lot of trees. And although they're not all near power lines, Overstory would love to understand all the trees in the world so we can help manage them better as part of our critical natural resource for biodiversity and other reasons as well. But it's really great for many of us at Overstory to realize that we have a very valid business model right now that is working to help us build these systems to understand trees from space at scale right now for utilities and maybe for other people and other uses down the line. Now, I know it's EMF, so I thought I should get a little bit technical and mention some of the technologies that we use to really make this scale. We use Jupyter Hub, so a lot of Jupyter notebooks for our data science to experiment with different kinds of pipelines and systems. And then we use Dask and Dagster to orchestrate everything together so we can run both experimental and production pipelines on large data sets at scale. And Overstory is a lovely team. We are not all technical people. As I mentioned earlier, we have a great team of arborists who work with us. And they help us understand what we're seeing and actually do things like training our machine learning models to be as effective as they can be. So working with arborists means that we're not just viewing the trees as a collection of pixels, but as real living entities. And we can start to understand how they behave, how they're affected by climate change and by different conditions so that we can then produce better models to figure out which trees need that little bit of tender loving care to make sure they do not hit a power line. I will say it's a really great team to work in. This was our team gathering in the Netherlands in January this year. It's a really diverse team as well. One of our sales guys, actually, this is his first desk job. Literally, this is the first job he's had where he works at a desk quite a lot of the time. Before that, he was a wildfire fighter. 
who would spend weeks on end camping in the wilderness fighting wildfires in mainland America. And it's incredible to have people like that on the team bringing such deep experience, very much grounded in the physical reality to help us build really practical systems to support better tree and vegetation management. So, looping back to my first question, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Yes. But with a little bit of help from modern technology like satellites and machine learning, it hopefully won't start a fire or take out the power to a whole neighborhood. Thank you for watching. I will be in the Q&A tent. <laughs>